implementation of uh, earthquake detection using AI and deep learning. Uh, this is an earthquake catalog, a simple list of uh, the most basic but fundamental parameters describing earthquakes, means location, origin time, and magnitude. Uh, this is perhaps the most widely used product of seismologists outside of seismology. Mm. Uh, inside the seismology, a lot of things that we have learned about earthquake processes were coming basically from performing various kind of analysis on these earthquake catalogs that we knew that they are neither complete nor uh, free of errors. So these are the main processing steps for building an earthquake catalog from recorded waveforms. And there are several complications in performing each of these tasks. That's why many different algorithms have been developed in past decades for each of these. The latest trend is to use AI and especially deep learning to produce more reliable and more complete and complete catalogs by improving the effective, effect, effectiveness and efficiency of data processing. So we have worked on uh, different parts and aspects of this uh, over past few years in our own groups. Uh, I'm sure Greg presented a much more comprehensive and complete overview of these in his talk just a few weeks ago. So today I'm going to just a uh, deep dive into only one of these models, EQ Transformer, that performs two of these tasks, uh, earthquake detection and phase speaking. Uh, application of AI for these two specific tasks has uh, reached to a level that now, by reviewing the progress uh, process itself, we can learn some good lessons that hopefully would be useful for other tasks as well. So uh, I will start with some background and in introduction first, and then uh, talk about the EQ transformer, and then try to wrap up some of the conclusion uh, that we can make out of this uh, specific model. So let's first start by uh, automatic uh, detection and face picking algorithm. Over the past 50 years, seismologists have developed many different algorithms to automate these two tasks. We can, uh, I, I put them into two main categories of characteristic function-based and similarity search-based method. Uh, in characteristic function-based method, Usually, a simple linear or sometimes nonlinear transformation is used to construct a function that highlights uh, earthquake signal or particular phases within the continuous uh, data and make it easier to distinguish them. The advantage of these group of method is that they are fast, they generalize well, meaning that they can detect events with non-similar waveform, but this generalization tends to be their weakness as well, uh, because they cannot make a uh, distinction between an earthquake signal or a very uh, non-earthquake impulsive uh, uh, signal. Uh, moreover, they are sensitive to the background noise, on the other hand, we have this similarity search-based method, like template matching, uh, that look for uh, repeated events with a strikingly similar waveform. So they are more robust and generally result in much lower false positives rate. Uh, however, they are limited to repeated events and this comes with a much higher computational cost due to multiple search process. Thus, uh, we can put them into uh, at the at two ends of the spectrum for efficiency and robustness. 
Deep learning models can bring us the advantage of both of these approaches by uh, being robust and efficient at the same time. This is what we knew from the uh, early application of deep learning for detection and peaking, uh, which are not long time ago. But since then, our understanding of how these uh, new generation of detection and face, uh, face detectors and face speaker work, and how can we improve them have been changed. For instance, the first deep learning detector was introduced uh, as a more as a fast way of doing template matching, in a sense that it was uh, 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 in a sense that uh, uh, we uh, uh, it was introduced in a way that we need to build a new model for each region using some templates. Uh, as training data. But soon we learned that deep learning models can do uh, more than that by being a kind of universal, by learning a kind of universal template that can reflect general characteristics of earthquake signal. And we learned this by developing many different deep learning models and applying them on different regions and case studies to better understand the limitations of these models. One of the reasons uh, for popularity of this task in, uh, is the availability of large-scale large label data for training. The second reason is that detection and face picking are conceptually easy problem to understand. You don't need to have a PhD in seismology to know that what is the detection or uh, picking P or S waves. And because of this, uh, there was a relatively good contribution outside of geoscience community. Several of these models have been developed by computer scientists, electrical engineers, exploration seismologists, and civil engineers, which is a good example of bringing new perspectives and expertise into the field. But did we take the full advantage of this high number of studies? The answer is no. Why? Uh, what has happened is, uh, what is happening usually is that people pick one method, some data, they train their network and using part of data and then test it on other, uh, apply it to another uh, part of the data set and then report, report some numbers as the, uh, indicating that their model was successful or worked better than another model, and that's it. Uh, as a result, not only we don't know which of these models uh, would uh, be more, uh, would work better, we, either, uh, we don't know even the answer to some of our uh, more basic question, like what type of neural networks or combination of them would be more appropriate to model earthquake signals, or which network architecture would be more suitable for a particular task, or which model modeling approach should we take, a multitask or task specific, uh, which domain is more suitable for a particular task, or what pre-processing should we uh, apply prior to the training? Should we bandpass uh, filter the waveform or not? If yes, what frequency range would be the most appropriate one, etc. Or during the training, how should we augment our data to better represent the real world cases? Uh, after the training, how should we measure or record uh, the performance of our model? Which metrics uh, would fully represent the performance of uh, performance for a particular task, uh, or what would be a good baseline model and benchmark data set for each task, and what uh, we should expect from the deep learning models, which itself would define what would be the failure or success in application of these models. 
So this is because not only our approaches and network architectures are different, people use different data set, different pre-processing steps, and at the end, report performance with different metrics and other uh, and often the results are not reproducible. This is not the case in other fields like the computer vision, speech recognition, where machine learning applications are more mature and uh, fairly standard benchmarking procedures exist. Uh, so for application of AI in seismology, a more systematic way of doing these studies is, would be as important as just developing more and more models. So now let's uh, have a just uh, quick overview to see what, uh, when we say deep learning, what we actually uh, mean and what we are talking about. Machine learning is a, includes a wide variety of techniques with different levels of complexity uh, that many of them can be used for earthquake detection and phase picking. Over here, we are going to just concentrate only on one branch of this, specifically consisting of deep neural networks. But what are the neural networks and how do they work? Uh, they basically consist of some neurons or perceptron uh, arranged into the into some layers. Each each of these neurons take a bunch of inputs and then produce one output by first multiplying the input by their associated weight, which is a linear transformation basically, and then adding a bias term, uh, which is a translation, and then finally applying a nonlinearity. So these output are ultimately used to predict uh, or desired label, uh, which can be used to calculate a prediction error uh, using a loss function, and then use this error to adjust all these connection weights in a backward process called back propagation. So doing so after a number of iterations, the network can learn a highly nonlinear relationship between or input and or a target label in a learning fashion called supervised layering. Uh, so what a neural network does is basically just a high-level transformation of data. Through such a transformation, it basically bends the space, and with the space, it bends the data. Thus, if it cannot initially solve the problem, it transfers the problem and it makes this transformation multiple times at each layer to finally make the problem easy enough to be solved. Uh, this makes the neural network a very powerful tool, even with one layer and just a few neurons, like this one uh, in the early uh, neural network applications in seismologies back in 80, it's late 80s and 90s, even at that time, people knew that nonlinearity of uh, the system would increase if they would use more layers or more neurons in each layer. However, there were some technical issues like overfitting, vanishing, or exploding gradients, and of course, computational resources that were limiting them from having more layers or deeper network. What has happened uh, in more recent years is appearance of large and high quality labeled data set in addition to powerful computing tools like GPUs that enabled the researcher to find some solution for those technical issues that I mentioned earlier in previous slide, uh, and mainly through some empirical uh, exploration. Uh, that include like building a better activation function, regularization techniques, uh, and et cetera. Uh, one uh, thing that uh, worth mentioning is that a lot of you may have uh, heard of like the impact and importance of like large scale data set like ImageNet through the uh, 
evolution of deep learning, but it, it worth noting that this data set was not the, uh, the largest uh, data set of image, uh, labeled images. Actually, even back then, there was much larger data sets of uh, labeled images, but ImageNet it was the uh, most accurately labeled. So the quality of the labels are very important as well. So anyway, uh, these enable uh, the researcher to now put many more neurons together to form really long or deep networks with complicated architectures like these ones that now performs very well in a lot of uh, tasks. You can think of these modern networks with convolutional operators as a cascade of filters that can automatically extract what is relevant to a task from data and transform it properly. These particular network architectures that I put here uh, as example are just some famous architectures that e now you can consider them as the main ancestors of the modern uh, neural networks with a wide variety of, uh, which now have a wide variety of types and applications. But what would be what type of uh, these do, uh, deep neural networks would be the most appropriate one to model the earthquake signals? Uh, so one way of addressing this question might be to see that uh, what type of data or earthquake signal are more, more are most similar to. Uh, this is one example of earthquake waveform with some of the main elements or seismic phases being labeled on it. At first, at first glance, uh, the shape of this time series might remind you something like audio signal, which makes sense to some extent, as earthquake signal are just much uh, have just much lower frequency than the audible range, but by just some compression and shifting them to a higher pitch, we can actually lessen, them, lessen to them. For instance, this example here sounds something like this. That was the surface wave. But this does not mean that this is the best way of thinking them, uh, think, thinking of them. As unlike the audio signal, we usually record the earthquake in three separate channels to capture the motion in three perpendicular direction, which this might remind you the RGB channels in the image data structure. And moreover, there is uh, some specific ordering or temporal relationship uh, that always exists among different seismic phases or building blocks of this waveform that makes them somehow similar to text or other sequential data. And these are not all. The mechanism that these waves are generated and propagated through the uh, Earth uh, adds some other characteristic to seismic signal uh, that I'm not going to talk about all of them here. But the main point that I wanted to make here was just that we are dealing with the form of data that does not fully fit into any of the common data structures that uh, exist in computer vision, speech, or NLP. And this is what makes things a bit more interesting. In earlier, in, uh, or earlier works, we search for an optimal deep learning approach for modeling earthquake signals and uh, for detection and phase picking. Uh, in these works, we were trying to maximize uh, the speci um, specific objectives in each of these tasks uh, by building a separate model for each of them. 
But these two tasks are highly relevant to each other. For instance, when we are uh, we, we do the detection, which the goal is to identify earthquake from non-earthquake signal, knowing that the, this whole waveform that we think it is an earthquake consists of both, uh, contain both P wave and S wave would be unhelpful uh, information. On the other hand, in the peaking, knowing that the, uh, this tiny uh, arrival that we think it would be an S wave is located within an earthquake waveform and is coming after the P wave. That's a, another valuable information that can help us to declare it as S wave more confidently. In other words, contextual information here plays an important role. Based on these, we design our new model as a multitask network that. Uh, perform both of these tasks simultaneously, and by doing uh, so, it improves the performance. It has one central encoder that uh, takes the three-channel waveform and transform it into a high-level representation, and then three separate decoders use this high-level representation to produce three sequence of probabilities associated with the existence of earthquake signal, P wave, and S wave. Here, to introduce, uh, to incorporate that contextual information that I just talked about it in previous slide, we used a technique called attention mechanism. Attention mechanism in deep learning is a technique that allows us to highlight some part of the data that are more important or relevant to a few uh, and put fewer weights on the part that has less relevant to a specific task. This has been inspired by the a human vision mechanism. Uh, when we look at an image, we can focus on a smaller region of that with high resolution and while perceiving the surrounding part with lower resolution. In machine learning, uh, we simulate this by calculating a pairwise similarities between the input data while optimizing a loss function for a, a certain task. But uh, there is not just one way of calculating this attention weight. There are many different mechanisms and network architecture that one of the most famous one of them uh, one of the most famous uh, one, is a model called transformer, mainly developed for uh, machine translation in natural language processing. However, what we have used here, and although I call it transformer, is totally different thing than that famous architecture, uh, except for the overall form or residual structure of that. And the main reason for this comes from differences between the data structure in seismic uh, modeling and machine translation, which prevents us to benefit from the speed up that architectures like transformer uh, can offer by eliminating the recurrence. So uh, the attention layers in OR network or, or transformer are more similar to classical ones, but we try to arrange them into a top-down hierarchical structure through the use of global and local attention calculation. To make the memory and runtime in LSTM and self-attention layers more manageable, uh, we use a convolutional and uh, pooling at the beginning of the encoder uh, for downsampling. And we took advantage of different techniques, such as residual learning, networking network, a stack of convolutional and LSTM blocks to extend the encoder part, this part of the network, uh, while managing the error rate and training speed to improve the generalization and noise robustness of our model. And 
upsampling and convolutional layers at the end of each of these decoders uh, are just to produce the output predictions with the same temporal resolution as the input seismogram. So that will increase the precision of our peaks. Uh, so this is very important uh, 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 as just one milliseconds of error in peak uh, can translate to tens of meters of error in earthquake location estimation. So the network overall has 56 layers uh, in total, uh, followed by dropout layers uh so uh, we thought that would be a good uh place to also estimate the epistemic uncertainties through a, a technique called monte carlo dropout techniques uh, basically what is uh what this technique does is that during the inference we randomly uh, turn off and on some of these uh neurons and layers and as a result each uh, prediction would be different than the previous one. So uh, doing a number of predictions during the inference, uh, we can basically get a sense of uh, the variability of our uh, model prediction and use them as a uh, uncert uh, model uncertainty. So as I mentioned earlier, the attention weights are just pairwise similarities. So they are visually Unlike the uh, uh, convolutional uh, kernels in convolutional neural networks, they are visually informative. So by looking at them, we can basically say that at uh, particular layers, which part of our input data receive more attention of our network. Uh, so for instance, we see that at the end of this encoder part, the network has already learned to put more weights or pay more attention to the parts of the waveform where earthquake signal exists. And then these waves are directly passed to the detect, uh, detector uh, branch as additional contextual information for detection. But for P and S wave peaking, uh, we first pass these uh, weights to a secondary uh, attention layer, uh, which have some constraint on their window length to further direct the attention of our network to smaller areas within the waveform containing a specific seismic phase. So the design uh, of this network was intended to mimic the way that human analysts process the earthquake signal. Analysts, uh, when they process the data, they first look at the entire waveform, usually on multiple channel or multiple station, to have a bigger picture of what earthquake full waveform uh, looks like. And that would help them to confirm if this is an earthquake or no, just a rock hitting next to the sensor. And then they will zoom in to a smaller region uh, or parts of the waveform to pick the arrival time more precisely. As I mentioned, the precision of peaks is very important. And we can see uh, this process from the learning curve of our networks. So uh, we can see that the network is start basically learning to pick uh, P, P and S waves after that it already learned to detect the earthquakes. Uh, so we use a STED, uh, which is a larger scale data sets of labeled earthquake and non-earthquake signal publicly available to train our network. Uh, these are some results from our test set. As you can see, the earthquake can come with variety of different uh, different um, signal shape but the model could uh, work well for all of these uh, types or waveform shape the 
this this example shows the advantage of that multi-task approach and combining the detection and face picking better. Uh, there are more than 20 to 30 second time delay between high energy arrivals of P wave and S wave in this example. Uh, but in all of them, all of these cases, the model correctly identified, uh, correctly picked these waves as part of a single event rather than two individual with smaller events. Uh, these are some examples of high background noise, uh, which you see that the model was able to handle very well. Uh, all examples that I showed, uh, you see that uh, uh, these basically deviation are that uncertainty estimation that I talked about. All of these examples that I showed you so far were coming from or tested, uh, which are coming from the similar uh, data set, the estates that we use for training, uh, which include three component data for only uh, uh, one single event in each one minute time window. But what if we, uh, if this was not the case in, in real world application? So during the training, we implemented this augmentation on the fly uh, as in each batch, half of the data were augmented, uh, augmented version of the other uh, of the waveform in other half uh, were. Uh, there was a specific chance for uh, uh, these uh, numbers percentage were basically a specific chance of applying each of these augmentation on each waveform during the training. So as uh, you can see from this example, uh, this training procedure was successful. Uh, and as a result, the model can pick uh, events uh, at different location within the time window uh, when uh, there are multiple events within a time uh, one minute window, like these examples. Uh, and when some channels are broken or uh, are missing, like these two examples, or just one single channel data is available, or when just a portion of the data uh, earthquake signal was uh, captured. So uh, the data augmentation is basically the feeling, the gap between the distribution of or training data and the actual data in real applications. And so it is very important to know what type of regularity uh, and problematic cases could exist in the real world data. And for each of these scenarios, have a plan during the training time. So this is the or detection uh, performance, only one false positive out of almost uh, 111,000 test sample, uh, means it didn't miss any earthquake signal. Uh, we compared the performance of our model uh, for both detection and phase picking with eight deep learning and four traditional model using the same test set. Uh, here, the uh, uh, beside just showing that this uh, model or new model performed well, we learned a lot of good uh, and interesting result. Uh, for instance, uh, one of the take home lesson that we can get from this table is that uh, the size of data set uh, wouldn't be a very, important uh, factor, as you can see some of these uh, models uh, with much smaller uh, size of training set perform better than uh, other model with super large data sets. Uh, another interesting observation was that, for instance, for the case of comparing CRED and EQ transformer, uh, where they were 
both uh, train on the same uh, training data set, but the architecture was very different. We see that uh, the performance was not that much different. So this means that it's not just about the architecture and neural network type. Uh, uh, another interesting point that I uh, can mention uh, is that uh, some of these uh, models that uh, perform uh, fairly well, like PhaseNet uh, or uh, this one, PPKNet, uh, they, they all were using uh, a sort of augmentation technique. So these uh, highlight the importance of data augmentation uh, during or training process itself during the building of a model. So this brings us some new insight about how to build a better models. Uh, overall, we observe that here uh, uh, I have uh, plotted the uh, deep learning uh, peakers uh, with warmer colors, while the uh, colder what uh, colors are traditional algorithms. We can see that deep learning ones systematically perform better on noisier data compared with the traditional ones. And this improvement of performance is more significant for S waves. Uh, these are the deviation of our automatic peaks from ground truth uh, that were mainly manual peaks. Overall, you see a larger deviation for S peaks, but this does not mean that uh, EQ transformer has more problem on peaking S as uh, digging through the data set, we noticed that most of these problems come from, from the error in the ground truth. So a human analyst has more problem on peaking the S wave, uh, as you can see from these few examples. In analyzing the test result, we didn't find a very uh, anything surprising. Uh, the prediction errors tends to be higher for magnitude and distance ranges that were we had fewer data for in our training data sets. So they were, uh, I would say, uh, not fully represented during the training process. Uh, the most important ob observation we had was that we did not find any significant correlation between the estimated model uncertainties using that dropout techniques that I mentioned and the peaking errors. Uh, but uh, however, we can see that these error uh, uncertainty estimation, uh, we can see that, uh, that uh, from this uh, example where P and S waves were peaked with relatively high confidence in these uh, non-earthquake signals. However, we can see that these uncertainty, uh, un uncertainties for uh, detection, uh, the green uh, basically er uh, areas uh, that might be helpful to distinguish some of these false positives uh, from the actual earthquakes. So uh, now let's uh, go back to our uh, data set. As you can see, the training uh, set does not include any data from Japan, which makes it an ideal place to put our model into a more difficult test. So we selected uh, an event in the southern part of Japan. This is um, the 6.7 Totori earthquake that occurred in 2000. We applied our model to five weeks of continuous data recorded right after the earthquake around this region. And these are the earthquake that we found. We found more than 20,000 earthquakes and that can eliminate the fault that uh, that the main earthquake and the main shock occurred on. Uh, 
we do see that how earthquake starts and stop along the fault structure and by improving our ability to detect and locate a smaller earthquake we can now build a high resolution image of the fault structure and get a better view of how earthquake interact with each other or how they spread along the fault and how they get started and even how they get stopped so overall we were able to increase the size of the, uh, an earthquake catalog uh, uh, generated by uh, jma uh, with uh, more than twofold uh, and this improvement were obtained by only using a fraction of the stations that were available for us to use and with the cost of 25 minutes or so fully automated processing on CPUs. To get a better sense of uh, the accuracy of our AI-based peaks, we compared them with the hand peak arrival uh, times, hand peak arrival times by Japanese analysts who seems to be very good at their job. As you can see, uh, now the error distribution for p and s waves are very similar unlike the previous histograms that i showed you which just show that they did much better job in picking their s waves uh, the mean deviation was 0 0.01 second which means that on average or peaks differs only by one sample point uh, which shows not only a, this AI-based uh, model can generalize well to different regions and data, they can be super precise as well. These peaks are from uh, those uh, events that both we and Japanese group detected and peaked on the same sets of stations, but we got many more events. What were those new events that we found from this relatively old earthquake sequence that happened almost 20 years ago. Uh, you see that these new events that we found were mainly a smaller earthquake that were not detected or picked by JMA. Why? Because these smaller earthquakes have weaker and noisier waveforms like these ones, which are really hard uh, if, we, if not impossible to pick by humans. So this earthquake uh, that we just saw uh, happen in Japan, which has lots of earthquake and a lot of uh, tectonic activities are going on in that particular region, uh, like this giant slab uh, that's subducting under the region. Uh, but now let's travel in time and space and go from Japan 2000 to uh, central US in 2010 uh where these two earthquakes happen at the middle of continent where not only uh, does not have any slab or tectonic activities it did not used to have any earthquake or even no fault was known to exist in this region uh prior to these magnitude four events that happened in 2010 this guy Greenbrier sequence was an, is performed like a benchmark uh, in our group. So we tested various uh, of uh, different of our previous models on this. So that was a good and uh, a second test uh, for EQ transformer. Uh, here I have uh, these uh, markers are basically some uh, wastewater injection way, well where the size of the marker is proportional to the volume of injection. Uh, we see that while there were some injection in uh, injection activities in the area back in like 20, uh, 2009, there was no earthquake uh, until the injection started from this wall, which apparently initiated the fault, uh, which now we can see it more clearly through all these micro earthquakes that we 
detected and located using uh, EQ transformer, which is slightly performed better than our previous model, PhaseNet, on this sequence. Uh, let's just watch it one more time. So the sequence start and stop after uh, shortly after the injection stops uh, at that wall. So uh, uh, as I mentioned earlier, like uh, reproducibility was a main uh, uh, issue uh, from our point of view. As a result, we put the uh, uh, or model. Uh, um, we made it publicly available, uh, and as a result, it has been used uh, uh, by many uh, researchers over the past few uh, months. And we started getting some nice feedback and interesting results. So, for instance, this is an example that somebody sent me. Uh, which is from a station in Texas. Uh, they thought that that's an interesting case with lots of false negative, missing all of these events. Uh, but when uh, I look at it more closely, look at the uh, data, it turns out that none of these impulsive waveform are actually earthquake. And they were basically generated by a few of these drilling machines at the nearby. So that's a good example to show these uh, AI-based models can be reliable and work very robustly in even noisy environments like this one. One of the reasons for this performance was that in addition to the earthquake, uh, a state data set uh, has a good uh, number of wide variety of non-earthquake uh, signals like this one, more than 140,000 of them, which help us to build a more complex model uh, to identify earthquake from non-earthquake uh, signals. Uh, this basically makes the learning uh, process more complex. Uh, this is another interesting example. Well, although a bunch of smaller earthquakes have been detected by EQT. Uh, these big earthquake uh, that happened at the middle of these traces were not uh, was not detected, which is simply because of uh, our design. Uh, we designed this network architecture by this limiting the uh, detection to the one minute window for specifically uh, for the local earthquake in the range of up to 100 kilometer distance range. The earthquake that you are seeing here is a more than 2,000 kilometer away. Uh, and our model was not supposed to pick it. So earthquake with magnitude around 4.5 and above can be recorded almost anywhere on the globe. And this is an main issues for local networks and early warning systems that uh, their target area is more local. And they usually put a lot of effort to just filtering out these unwanted teleseismic signal, which we see that uh, is a nice attribute of these deep learning models that they can automatically actually filter uh, these unwanted events. Uh, based on all of these tests and observation, we can uh, conclude that all these uh, factors play important roles in uh, building a deep learning detector or deep learning model for seismology uh, in general, I can say, uh, that affect the performance of final model. Or I arrange them based on their relative importance. You can see that I gave the network architecture the lowest priority, while I consider myself as a technical guy who loves playing with this stuff. Uh, the reason for this is that uh, having a more advanced technique alone would not necessarily result in a better model. A neural network is just a tool. 
having a more advanced or complicated network is like having a more powerful or flexible tool but to build a good model using this tool you need to have a good data or material on hand as well the quality and characteristic distribution of your data sets are very important and even more important is how to train uh, how how to do the training using this data and the network how do you uh, how you do the training and design your network and the approach that you take for a specific task is based on the insight that you have about the problem and about the challenges in the real world data so i would call them skills or art that you need to uh, apply your uh, tools to your material correctly and intelligently so uh, that can be my conclusion uh, so in summary ai can help us to detect earthquakes uh, not only more effectively but also more efficiently and precisely uh, we saw that by particularly empowering just uh, uh, and as a result, it can empower the whole earthquake monitoring uh, uh, workflow. We saw that just by uh, improving two of uh, these task detection and picking how much new information we could gain from this uh, from the same type of data that have been processed over and over and with that i will stop here and would be happy to take uh some questions if you have okay thank you thanks very much could people please unmute and maybe bring your camera on too if you'd like to join me in thank you Very beautiful Mustafa. Um, raise, use the raise hand feature at the bottom, if you would, and we particularly encourage um, early career scientists to uh, ask questions. So, please. Chris Johnson, please go ahead, and then Laura. Hey, Mustafa, that was a great talk. <clears throat> Thank you. So I, I understand your modeling and everything that you're doing, and it's, it's, I think it's a very powerful tool. <clears throat> and as you mentioned at the end, it's specifically designed for local seismicity or regional, you know, out to 100 kilometers. So what are your thoughts on taking the input data from streaming networks and doing this in real time? Because the way your architecture is set up now, you basically have to wait a minute and then you can process that piece of data and you can then feed it through the workflow. But how do you see this evolving if you wanted to do this in real time so that you know it was equivalent to like an SDALT where you're just almost immediately getting these picks? All right. So uh, is correct that you need the one minute of wait to do the first prediction but this does not mean that you need to wait for another one minute to do the second prediction so you can do the second prediction like two seconds later uh, like having this like moving window like thinking it as a moving window two seconds later you can uh, do another prediction for uh, like uh, um, another window that may be highly overlapped with the first right. one. The reason for that is the prediction time uh, of our network for each window is less than a second. Uh, so it means that uh, although that might be a still uh, slightly higher than the streaming speed, but as still very uh, good, uh, good enough to do it in real time and uh, make a prediction as quickly as you need. 
Okay. You can, it's very easy to expand it to a real time. So you don't think a different model design where it's taking some real input stream as opposed to these overlapping windows would work? Uh, but, uh, the, the point is that like uh, the performance of the, like around one second and like l slightly less than one second uh, is good enough for most of our real like time application in seismology. Although we have tested uh, some other like more uh, I would say efficient architecture to even uh, beat the speed of stream, uh, streaming so we can go even as as low as like even less than this as, uh, streaming speed uh, which I would say is not that much different from like people. Uh, you can improve it. Like, you can go faster by taking another network, specifically like net architecture like WaveNet or these dilated uh, temporal convolutional neural networks uh, that can speed up. But that is speed that the gain is in, in, in total is not that much. Right. Okay. Thanks. A very nice talk. Thank you. Laura, please go ahead. Yes, thank you. Um, I have a question about the model. And uh, why did you choose to use only one attention, one head attention? Because uh, since you have three targets, mm -hmm. I would have expected at least three heads. Uh, three types or three heads? Um, three, you have three targets, right? The detection, right. the mm -hmm. uh, detection. is not just one yes. attention. Then right. why, uh, can you please come back to the slide where you show the model? Yeah, yeah sure. Look, it is not just one attention. So, uh, here we have a, a stack of two attention here. That's just these two directly are connected to the detection branch. So you can think of them as a attention for the earthquake. And then that will pass to second attention layer here. I call it local attention because it has a uh, constraint on the window length. That's for P wave and then another attention layer for S wave. So we have basically one uh, attention layer at the beginning of each of the phase speaker and uh, and another uh, attention layers at the beginning of the detection uh, branch. So they have separate their own attention. Okay, maybe I got confused by one of the following slides uh, when you say that uh, the difference between this uh, transformer and the original, let's say, is that uh, here you use only one head attention. Okay, thank you. Now here, in the blue box, basically, the, the area that earthquake waveform exists get highlighted. That's enough for us to detect the earthquake. But for phase picking, we do like a third attention mechanism on going one step further to focusing more on particular phase within the earthquake signal. So that's that's what they call it hierarchical attention mechanism. So we, we yeah. narrow that. Okay, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Mustafa, it's me. Um, I'm really impressed and uh, thank you very much for such a very nice talk. Um, I, I guess I have a question about um, the possibility that in your local area, you have a, you know, you're trying to identify local earthquakes. What if there's um, some change in the seismic velocity structure? Can, would, would that, you know, will that bother anything in terms of the way the model works? Will it be able to recognize that there might be a delay, let's say between P and S that's not associated with the, the event being f farther away, but being associated with uh, some new, uh, you know, some difference in the local velocity structure. 
so yeah, there, there can be a lot of uh, like changes and uh, but what uh, but, but that type of change that you mentioned, like the velocity change, these are not any problem as we try to build the model generalized enough that work on multiple regions that already have like different velocity model around the world. So because of that is is that like velocity change necessarily won't be any issue. Uh, another ch things that change all the time is the instrument response. Uh, so that's also uh, we we make the network, but that this training uh, procedure that include a wide variety of instrument type globally uh, in that global data set, basically we make the, uh, the model insensitive to the instrument type and instrument response. So these are like basically uh, the advantage of like uh, uh, designing the, uh, the, the model building procedure like to go over uh larger area so these are the uh, i would say uh, factors that uh, we know that for sure that they won't like affect the performance but uh, still there can be some like uh most of the uh, problem especially for false positives arise when they have instruments that have totally different type of like characteristics, uh, sometimes the maybe the even depth can uh, cause some problems, like go out of the distribution. As uh, most of the events that we used have 